We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, but they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. It is not the 90s. That decade ended long ago. So sings our guest today on his podcast, Dominic's Little Old Purple Column. But I have a feeling we're going to be talking a lot about that decade because many of my viewers will know him as the presenter of perhaps the greatest video game show ever to appear on UK television, Games Master. Yes, I hope to talk about that today, but there is much more to our guest than that. Journalist, comedian, musician, farmer, radio DJ, novelist, Retro gamer, perhaps. Let's find out all about him. Welcome, Dominic Diamond. Thank you very much, Neil. A pleasure to be joining you across the Atlantic. Yes, because you're based in Canada. That's right. Yes, I am. Yeah, right on the uh, kind of just at the western edge of the prairies, a uh, province called Alberta, a city called Calgary, just me and a bunch of cowboys. That's basically it, and a whole <laughs> lot of mountain. But it wasn't always like that, was it? Because you grew up in East Scotland in Arbroath, which uh, incidentally is about 30 minutes away from Dundee, the home of the Timex Sinclair factory. So I'm, I'm kind of, we've got a tenuous retro computing link in there already. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we did. No, Dundee's always been a, a phenomenal place in terms of, of technology. So yeah, I mean, obviously Timex, Timex back then, but it's kind of, you know, things like uh, um, you wouldn't have Grand Theft Auto without Dundee because that's you know that's that's where they all started out there Rockstar Games you've got the um, Aberte University in Dundee that's one of the finest kind of computer programming courses there's a whole generation of people that have come through that that east coast so it was definitely Dundee was um we always looked up to Dundee our both was a kind of your quintessential small seaside town Dundee was the big city where uh, you know with technology and journalism because they they published, uh, Dundee had DC Thompson, they did the great comics of the day, the Dandy and the, the Beano, and uh, and there was a whole lot of people actually that ended up going from that era of Dundee down to London, who I then worked with in the 90s, when they were editors of like Smash Hits and FHM and, and things like that. But no, our growth, was, our growth wasn't quite Dundee, but we did have though, which Dundee didn't, we had a proper genuine massive uh, arcade in like the Ooh. late 70s, which was ahead I, of Dundee. I was going to ask about arcades, but let's just talk about Arbroath in general to start with. Mm. So growing up in the 70s in Arbroath, just just describe it. What was, what was it like to grow up there? <laughs> uh, try not to get your head kicked in on the way back from school <laughs> by uh, Stephen Gibson in particular. He was my bet noir. It was, um, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was, you know, a classic violent working class <laughs> Upbringing, loud, aggressive, shouty, dangerous, violent, um, but fun, you know, even if that sounds sounds weird. <laughs> and then, um, you, you know, and, and and then into this kind of world, this kind of dark world came, came video games when I was a kid. And it really kind of just took us away from the, that kind of pretty miserable life a lot of us were, were having. So when did that happen then? When did, when did video games first come into your life? We had, uh, and I, I keep forgetting the name of this. This was even uh, even before the Spectrum. We, we had a Spectrum, but before then we had one of these original uh, black and white uh, boxes that came with a free black and white TV. It was in our kitchen and it had like six variations on Pong, including hockey and football and there was tennis and tennis doubles and there was one very basic kind of zapper like gun shooting game and it was one of these controllers where the joystick didn't even go back to the middle so you pushed up and it stayed <laughs> up and you had to physically correct it back down so it was really hard to play but it was uh it was that was great that was that was the that was the first introduction to video games i had with you know me and my, my family yeah, so sh I mean, shy of the Magnavox Odyssey, the, the Pong consoles were, you know, the first that many of us ever got to see. So you were right there from the start. Yeah. Um, I've got to ask as well. This is important. The family car, the childhood family car. What was it? it well, we were we were actually quite. It's cool now. It didn't seem cool at the time. We had a Ford console that we had because we were very poor, and we got a Ford console from my gran when she got a new car, and and other kids took the 
laughed out of us because, you know, it was this big giant box. But I would imagine now it's probably actually one of the coolest cars to drive around in because it was like it was like a you could fit a small town inside the interior was absolutely <laughs> cavernous so yeah ford console that was a lovely ford car console yeah. nice and was there a, an industry in our growth attached to it um fishing basically fishing, fishing. Uh, well yeah fishing and uh farming that was basically it so i uh, i never i never got to work on the fishing boats as a kid but i did do a hell of a lot of farming work we had we had the uh, raspberry it's a great part of the world for raspberries taste side in general in scotland so every summer we'd have to go out and pick raspberries every winter we'd have to go and pick potatoes um i i was lucky at times i even gravitated to the glamour of broccoli i remember cutting <laughs> broccoli as a kid um and uh yeah that was that was basically the three things so they, they were absolutely miserable because in the winter uh, when you went to to pick the potato we even had a dedicated holiday called the tatty holidays and it was two weeks that you got off from school just so you could go and pick potatoes in a field you can't I mean that's just that's barbaric and, then, and it was always freezing cold then and then when you got to the summer and you had to pick the raspberries that was just like wasps everywhere boiling hot and you would I remember at the end of the summer it would take it would take another year to get the red stains out of the scratches of your fingers and and this is where so this is like aged eight nine years old you're coming home like some dickensian factory worker even then good times good times yeah. Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> um, was, was was there like a family trade or was there an expectation of you to to go into any of these industries at the time you remember uh, no my, my 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 father was a was basically a chancer by trade so i guess maybe that that is kind of what i went into <laughs> he um he he there was quite a lot of people worked on the oil rigs uh, there was that okay. that boom, the North Sea oil boom at the time in the the seventies and, and early eighties, and so my dad ended up working there. And the other big thing you had in Arbroath is a four or five commando marine base. Uh, so yeah. it was this. So the, the oil rigs took off just when a whole lot of those guys were getting their papers out of the marines. So my dad ended up working with a whole bunch of ex marines uh, out in the oil rigs, and they were all part of the search and rescue team that went down on the end. My dad actually used to go down on the end of a helicopter wire uh, to pull people out of the sea. So that was that was actually kind of quite fun. My dad and all his friends were kind of crazy like that, and they were always doing like daft kind of stunts on each other. So that, that mm. was that was quite fun. But no, in terms, in terms of the uh, the family business, it was just basically trying to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you touched on an arcade earlier. Just tell us about... Mm. The Arbroath Arcade. Yeah, Jimmy O'Brien's Pleasure Land. It's down, it's right next to the uh, Arbroath Football Club's ground. And it was just the most incredible. It was it was a, a, a massive fairground covered. So it was open all, all year round. Mm -hmm. And most of it was, you know, waltzers and, uh, and dodgems and all that kind of stalls and the penny falls. But in the corner of it was the arcade machine corner. And it was incredible. You could kind of even though a fairground is a place full of lights and things whizzing around there was just that neon glow from this corner made it stand out and it it really was you would walk in and it was down the left hand side and you could just say it was it was almost like when you're playing a video game and there's a cave that you have to get to that's got a mysterious <laughs> light that was what the arcade game section uh was like in, in o'brien's and it was I, I can't i can't think of a game um, that 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 glorious uh, golden wave of arcade games that they didn't have there, so they oh, had okay. Space Invaders, Gorf, Pac Man, Joust, Defender, uh, Battle Zone. I mean, mm. everything. We had, I, I don't know who the buyer was, but man, they were they were way on top of their game back then. And they were current at the time. This wasn't old oh, games no. a generation later. This was when they came I out. Know. This was nice. all absolutely absolutely brand new, and it was incredible. And so it was a real. You know, our both on the coast. It rains a lot. Summers are nice, but it's kind of quite grey and cloudy. And then just this, this, these bursts of colour. And I was actually, I was just writing about Pac-Man for the uh, for this, the, the the podcast that I do. And I was saying, even the arcade cabinet of Pac-Man, that great splash of yellow, and the, mm -hmm. that stuff. We didn't really have a lot of yellow in our book. <laughs> so even the cabinets themselves leapt out at you. As being something that was just so alluring and compelling. 
Wow, I'm imagining a, a town that's just in black and white, like Wizard yeah, of Oz, and then much. Pac-Man comes riding into town. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so at what point, Dominic, did you stop and think, you know, I, I want my life choices to extend beyond this town, and and how did you start to make that move? I was, I was, uh, I was very lucky. It was all down to my mum. I was, I was a kind of clever kid, and uh, clever kids and. Small towns like mine get bored very easily. You get your work done and I, before the rest of the class, and I just started mucking about and misbehaving. And I started right. doing a lot of low-grade uh, scallywag stuff, you know, like knocking on people's doors, having left a pile of dog wrapped in a bag <laughs> on fire, all those horrible things that kids do. So I was always a bit bored and looking for for fun. And uh, in a lot of cases where I come from, you basically end up a drug dealer or some kind of criminal. Right. Uh, so luckily, my mom was like, no, we got to nip this in the bud. And she, uh, there was a posh boarding school in Perth, just outside Perth, called Strathallan. And every year they allowed one token working class kid into the ivory towers by way of a scholarship so i i, I my mum entered me for that and i and i got that scholarship and then basically went off to hogwarts uh, at, the, <laughs> at the age of 10 well I, I mean what did you did you have to do anything to prove your your worth to get into this place or did they just look over the work you'd already done what, what was oh no no it was a big exam it was it was, yeah, okay. it was it was it was really weird because i remember going up and and i'd never seen that but i mean it's this gigantic building and they had in the in the entrance hall, they had a giant stuffed bear and they had a stuffed bird as well, I think. And all these kind of old pictures of previous uh, headmasters. And there was like there were like those um, pictures in Scooby Doo's where you felt the eyes kind of followed you. So it was <laughs> it was a completely different world. And on it was a really kind of pressurized exam you had to do. But I uh, but you know I, I obviously did did okay and and, and got a scholarship and was uh, was allowed into this magical kingdom yeah did you feel that you did you feel pressure to uh, change yourself in any way to fit in in this this hogwarts as you describe it did... yeah, I, I, yeah absolutely with um i i um i was always very aware that i was from a different social class as the rest of these right. people and i i mean you know when when this is a great example. It's, it's so interesting that you asked about the family car. I remember that once my mum and dad came up and, and all the other kids there, they had brand new Bentleys and Rolls Royces and everything like that. And my mum and dad came up uh, to see me play rugby in this battered old four console and they just absolutely ripped the piss out of me. And so it was a lot of time. My mum and dad didn't come up a lot because, they, you know, they, they felt embarrassed that they weren't as rich as, as other people. And that is where I got the most ridiculous uh, work ethic because I felt I had to work 10 times as hard as anyone else there to prove that I belonged. And it wasn't that people were mean. I mean, they weren't. It was no different from any other school. People were lovely. And I, I mean, it was an incredible place and I loved it. And, and it, for me, it was the happiest years of, of my life un, until the 90s. But it was good because it meant that, you know, I got good grades and I did a lot of stuff and I did plays and I did music and I did sport. And like a lot of... Um, like a lot of schools, not necessarily boarding schools, but especially boarding schools, if you're in a sports team, that really make that makes a difference. Once you can crack a sports team, then then that's okay. And you did, did you? Did you find yourself on on a team? Yeah, yeah. God, yeah, Football. yeah. Rugby, hockey, Rugby, yeah. Uh, <laughs> athletics. I was I was lucky because I was a tall kid, and so I was and I had extremely long legs. So I literally <laughs> was like Daley Thompson's decathlon for real. Um, so uh, so yeah, it was good. And it, and what what is what was great about the school was it re. The, it's funny, they've just written a history of the school and I, I wrote the closing chapter and it's all about the motto, Labor Omnia Vincit, Work Conquers All. And they were very much, they very much tried to foster that in you that you could do anything that you liked in terms of sport, in terms of, you know, of drama and, and music and everything like that. And it was completely supported, horribly privileged. And it's a shame that nobody, you know, gets that same level. But I was lucky that I, you know, some people look back and, and remember that one teacher that, that got them through school and, and inflamed them with a passion for learning. I had 10. I was wow. just, I was very lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. Yeah. And I know that your next move um, took you more in, in a direction of drama. So you went to study drama. So that, that obviously bubbled up at this school or had that always yeah. been a passion of yours? Uh, well, we'd always, again, my mum was, was great for stuff like that. My mum always had us in like children's theatre groups and, and things like that. Angus Children's Theatre was the one we had on the East Coast. And I loved that. I did a play every year at school. 
And yeah, I was just like, oh, I'm definitely, definitely going to become an actor. Because I wanted to, I had that working class thing where you want to get out, you want to leave the town. And uh, for me, it was like, it was movies, TV, that was, that was the way that you were, that you were going to do it. So yeah, I, and I didn't, um, it wasn't my first choice, uh, Bristol. I did try Oxford and Cambridge. I tried those two and uh, I wasn't smart enough. I think my mum was really disappointed. I think she really, I think nobody from my, not many people from my town had gone to university, full stop, but certainly no one had ever gone to Oxford or Cambridge. And so I, in fact, I, it was so bad. I tried, I failed my first time to uh, get into Oxford. So I took a year off just to apply again, just so they could tell me again that I wasn't smart enough. So um, so I ended up with, with a lot of other Oxbridge rejects at Bristol University. That was definitely the next one down. But luck, but luckily for me, they, they had a drama course in one of the very few, I think maybe Manchester might have had one, but, but it was ve- certainly one of the very few drama courses that British universities had at, at that time in the early right. 90s. So it wasn't a case. It wasn't a case that Bristol was a beacon for drama, and this is where you went. It was just one of the few that happened to do it. It was one of your few options. Yeah, I, I think it's weird because there was definitely two different types of people in the drama department at Bristol. There were, you know, there were, there were people who hadn't got into Oxford, Cambridge, or in some cases York, Durham. But then there was there was a lot of of um, you know solid working class kids who had grown up really wanting to get into the theatre, and so it was. Um, it was politically really interesting. It was it was kind of quite a a hotbed of kind of left wing politics and and everything like that. So it was a it's a lot of dynamic people that were there. Yeah, and um, I've I've heard some of these people come up in in other interviews that you've done. So the likes of Simon Pegg, David Williams, mm. Matt Lucas, and other actors and comedians that you you were there with. Now now this is a podcast about gaming and computers. So. Was there ever any couch co-op gaming with Simon Pegg, maybe, or, or Matt Lucas throwing in some commentary? Did any of that happen? <laughs> well, no, Matt actually, Matt didn't, Matt didn't actually go to Bristol, but it's just oh, that right. he he went to national, he did national youth theatre. There was a lot of national youth theatre of, of uh, Great Britain people who went to uh, to Bristol, so Matt kind of knew David through national youth theatre, and then he kind of you know would kind of start hanging around Bristol. But um, no, there was there wasn't a lot of video gaming at that time. We we had a, we had a little arcade in the the students' union, and and that was good. But there was the only one I remember really playing. I was quite addicted. There was a futuristic American football game at the time. I can't for the life of me remember the name of it. And I used was to it play the Atari that. one where they've all got sort of t- tracks for feet. Yes, that that one. that's the one exactly. Oh, yes, right. someone will one. tell us in the comments exactly what that's called. <laughs> but I know the one. Yeah. And I I, I love to I love playing that. But I think it, it was really strange because that was my kind of three years at university was probably the least, probably the only part of my life where I wasn't playing a lot of video games because right. I, I just, I discovered um, like women and I just did <laughs> plays and I did, I started off doing stand up comedy there. So I just started doing all, all those things. And at the same time, I couldn't afford to buy an NES or, or anything like that. So it was those three years were a very fallow fallow gaming period for me yeah and how about bristol as a town did you take to bristol did you oh, yeah. have some good haunts oh yeah. honestly what a place neil i have to say especially that era 88 to 91 because you had a lot of music bursting up in bristol at that time uh massive attack and bands like that just one of those times you're in a city where there's just a lot of art bubbling up and, uh, and about to happen so that was there was definitely that feeling that there was there was a lot going on and just the the club scene, the whole um, uh, Manchester uh, scene that kind of filtered through the Moon Club and the Thecla and great places in Bristol where you'd go for a dance to to all this great indie music that was coming out as well. And yeah, it's not that far from here. The Thecla I think is still going strong. Is it? Um, oh great! And they have the Dot to Dot Festival, which is a really great festival where there's lots of live bands just playing all over the city, and you just walk from pub to pub. You've got a ticket to get into yeah. all of them. It's a it's a really great town, Bristol. Well, and, and it's. And it's interesting, you, you say walk there, and again, I think that's the other key, is that uh, especially being a student, I didn't have a car or anything. Bristol, you can walk to everywhere in Bristol. And it's funny, that's that's how I judge. I have lived now in so many damn cities all over the world, and that's the ones that I judge. That's how I judge them. The ones I like the best is a city where you can walk around most yeah, places. Totally. So um, so you, you mentioned that you were doing some stand-up comedy. Before that, you wanted to be an actor. You mm-hmm. get to the end of your three-year course, What's what? What are you thinking? What's next for you? Where do you want to go? What opportunities are there for you, if any? Well, it was weird. I I did well 
at acting, and I, I did a lot of good work, but I had a, <laughs> I had a problem with accents. I couldn't do any. <laughs> I remember appearing in Arthur Miller's All My Sons, and I had to do an American accent for that, and, and I think that was quite appalling. So I thought, hmm, I might struggle here. At the same time, as part of our final year project, you had uh, theatre uh, performance studies or um, production study, television production studies, and I the, the the performance studies one was a bit it was a bit pretentious. That was the only bad thing about Bristol was it kind of was a bit too avant garde, and it was like your third year drama department performance studies was people stripping naked and painting themselves purple. I mean, it was just it was that <laughs> kind of crazy, shit. and so I wasn't into that. Um, so I did the TV production studies. And I ended up, I, I hosted our mock TV show we did. And it was about, it was like an Oprah Winfrey style discussion show about how bad the teaching was at Bristol oh. University <laughs> Department of Drama. And that was so exciting. So we like filmed a lot of students moaning and everything about how bad the teachers were. And then we had a couple of them coming on to do a studio discussion. And that was just one of those eureka moments for me where I was like, wow, I had no idea there was this thing called talking words in front of a camera <laughs> that could be so much fun, as much fun as acting, and I don't have to worry about doing accents. So that kind of planted the seed. And also at the time, and I think it's still the case today, one of the best ways of getting a TV show was through being a stand-up comedian. And, and I always thought that what I would, because Sean Hughes had just made done this path, my path was going to be, I would uh, work the circuits, I would come up with a show, I'd do Edinburgh Festival, and then that would result in me getting a, a TV show. But when I left uh, Bristol and I went to London uh, and stand-up started to get really, really hard, I'd, I'd done a lot of student stuff and that was very mm. safe. But then the minute you're doing kind of grown-up comedy clubs when you're only 21, that's very tough because I because I was quite political and I wanted to do political comedy and it'd be like forty year old guys who've done a hard day's work and they would just go what the hell do you know about politics <laughs> twenty one years old I had little Harry Potter round glasses and everything so that was tough and I I was like oh and I couldn't handle that I, I wasn't one of these great comedians that can just you know have a have a witty comeback so I was lucky that TV kind of literally magically fell into my lap yeah so. And was that was that Games Master? Was that your first opportunity yeah, that, that, that fell that into was, your lap? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, well, it was it was the second. I mean, the first opportunity was the Word, and and they had this big nationwide search for a new presenter on that. And uh, I got um, similar to Oxford and Cambridge. I failed that, but ended up with something good, <laughs> a recurring sure. theme in my life. I got to like the last twelve for that, and then I thought that was it. My whole TV dreams are 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 gone. And I couldn't go back to stand up. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life now. And then luckily I, the phone rang one day and it was the, this very posh guy, Adam Wood, who said um, they were planning on making this new TV show called Games Master. And they'd asked the people at the Word if they could recommend anyone that they saw. And someone recommended me. It really was that much of a fluke. It was a real sliding yeah. thing. Just remind me, it was was the word, was it Terry Terry Christian? Was that yep. the word? There was uh, Terry Christian, uh, Amanda Academy, Danny Bear, and then that's that what the job that I auditioned for went to Katie Puckrick. So it was good. Katie okay. Puckrick was good. Um, so yeah, we, it's better than being beat to a job by Terry Christian. That <laughs> to, to, I didn't like to, to say. <laughs> So this opportunity has come up for this show called Games Master. Was was it called Games Master at the time, or did it have a working title before? So it's no, Games it's Master. Like, always Games Master. Always Games Master. And, yeah. Uh, and yes, yeah, so it was really interesting. It was weird because it was like, oh my god, the video game, great video games again. And so when they when they kind of spoke to me on the phone, and I, I was telling them about the Spectrum games I love playing, and about the arcades and everything like that. And and again, I made a joke that I'd said. Um, my I kept begging my girlfriend for a Nintendo Game Boy for Christmas, but she couldn't afford it. And ironically, that girlfriend, Mavami Moore, went on to produce Little Britain and certainly could afford it now. Um, I thought we could afford <laughs> 20 Game Boys now. So it was so weird when I, when I went to the audition for Games Master because it, I commentated on a Nintendo football game and it was on the Game Boy. And this was the first time I'd ever actually seen a Game Boy in action as well. So it was this weird mix of me going, oh, my God, look at this. And that game had quite big sprites. 
And I was like, wow. And then remembering, no, you're supposed to be auditioning. Be funny <laughs> and say things and don't just get kind of, you know, completely goggle-eyed over this incredible, <laughs> tiny little box of, of amazing technology. While trying to actually see the screen because it, was, it, was, it wasn't the easiest thing to see. Um, no, no backlight, this- no. Where did this audition happen? Am I right in thinking this was in a pub somewhere? Where you had no, to no, do no. This? It was, it was no. in the church. It was actually in the church that oh, we was ended in the church up uh, using as the as the set for the first series. So again, yeah. that was what was slightly bizarre. It was a very bizarre kind of thing to be, you know, to to be in a church in the east end of London with a bunch of guys you'd posh guys you'd never met before with this incredible machine. So it was all. It didn't really seem real in any way. I just thought, well, let's let's do the best we can do, and I, yeah. I and I did it in a certain style that the that they liked, or more pertinently, that Jane Hewlin, the big boss who came up with the show, it was her son Harry. He saw all uh-huh. the audition tapes because the whole reason she came up with the idea for Games Master was watching Harry and his friends playing Nintendo and seeing how competitive they got about challenges with each other. So he basically picked. The presenter, she said, right, there's Harry, 10, 11, 11, 12, 11 or 12 years old. And he saw the tapes and he laughed the most at mine. And that's how I got the job. It Perfect. really was down to a 12 year old kid who's obviously grown up now. But. Yeah. Now, we've got a lot of international viewers here who perhaps aren't familiar with Games Master. So, can you mm. just sort of describe the show? Give us the sales pitch for it. What, the easiest what is way Games can, Master? Yeah. The easiest way I can describe it is, you know, have you ever heard of esports? Uh, well, we invented it. Basically, um, we were the first TV show to have video games being played, commentating on them, uh, making fun of them. And I think that that's that was the absolute key thing about it. So that was the spine of our show. And then around that, we had features and reviews. But it, the, the difference was, was that we did it in a very strange, unique way in that we had a massive hologram yep hologram in 1992 right <laughs> uh, a hologram figure the games master who set the challenges so that was weird and i every series was set in a in a different um fantasy location and deliberately so because we tried to make it like a different level of a video game every year so it started off it was set in a church then it was set in an oil rig then a prison and then hell and then heaven <laughs> and then atlantis and then a desert island so that's what made it very, very strange, but also what was the key to its success because it was it wasn't just the first video games TV show that it was a very unique style of of TV show. I mean was, we spent yeah. hundreds of thousands of pounds on opening titles alone. It just it was the kind of things that just hadn't been done really on TV before. And in terms of popularity, do you do you have any numbers? Do you know how many might have tuned in at its peak? Yeah, three million. Um three million. basically but yeah, we were between uh we kind of sat about two million for most series, but three million was uh, was the highest that we got. So it was a quite incredible numbers. I mean, it was the top top three Channel Four show, and so and what that was what was amazing about it. And I th- again, that kind of helped is that when you have a new TV show, people will sit up and take notice. But the fact it was about these things called video games that nobody really writing in the British newspapers kind of understood or knew. It was like, wow, we got to find out more about this. So it was there wasn't a newspaper. In the, within a, a two weeks of the launch of Games Master, there was not a newspaper that didn't run an article on it. And then that all just kind of helps. And then these newspapers go, oh, there might be something in these video games. Let's start a video game section in our newspaper. So then people get drawn to video games and they go, oh, let's watch that video game TV show. And the whole industry kind of just fed there was almost like a three-pronged thing in the video games industry then in the UK. There was the Games Master TV show, there was the magazines and newspaper coverage, and the games themselves. And they all just fed into each other in the most wonderful way. Yeah. So, I mean, even if you've never heard of the show out there and you're listening to this, I hopefully that gives you a sense of the scale of the popularity of it. There was even the Games Master magazine spawned out of it itself. Yeah. So this was this was a big deal. Um but let's go back to the first episode, 1992. You make your appearance in uh, a waistcoat and a cravat, and you've got your smoking yeah. jacket. Yeah. I liked it. It's a timeless fashion, Dominic. I yeah. liked it. Uh, <laughs> was the wardrobe choice anything to do with you? Did you have any input? No, and that, that became <laughs> something that that, uh, that I, I really that really affected how much I enjoyed the show. The first season was okay. Um, you know, waistcoat, shirt, cravat, that was all right. I was a little bit more kind of... Um, vicar 
like than I was in in real life. But it, but it was okay. We still managed to get some some humour. And, and again, it was it was very strange how like I wanted to get. I wanted to present the word and the word for, for people who don't know that abroad was like super trendy youth culture music show. Like they had Nirvana on it. First TV show to ever have Nirvana play live. And so that I was really into my music. And so it was like so cool. And, and I'm convinced that to this day, I'm pretty sure that the reason I didn't get the word was I just, I was not cool enough for that show. I didn't, I wasn't good looking enough. So it was very strange to then go and do the show. And part of the appeal was that I wasn't a conventional looking youth TV presenter, but I kind of feel that that also kind of hampered me. And I felt very straight jacketed because it was only it wasn't really me that I was being. And then on the second series, this got even worse. Where I was, uh, the idea was it was a holiday camp on an oil rig, and I was dressed as a as a Butlins red coat holiday <laughs> um, camp counselor. And I absolutely hated that. I, I, I and I didn't I didn't even know Neil. I, I was so swept away with the success of series one because it exploded and I was I was going to a different city in Britain every weekend opening a new video game shop. I was going over to the USA to like CESs for the first time ever. And it was just a complete whirlwind and I wasn't really paying attention and they when they phoned, Oh yeah, we've got season two, great, brilliant. Okay, we're going to be set on an all rig. Yep, okay, brilliant. I'm only half listening. You're going to be dressed uh, you know in our big red jacket. Yep, fine. But and I turn up on the day, the first day and the, and I go to costume and I see and I'm like what the hell is that? And they said, well, we told you. I'm like, no, you didn't. And they said, yes, we did. So it was weird. It was, it was strange because that, that was when the show got insane when we were doing Games Master Live at the Birmingham NEC. And it, it was a massive financial and, and kind of television juggernaut. But I was really unhappy because I didn't feel like I was wearing my own skin on mm-hmm. the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I checked, the uh, just going back to that first episode, I, I started the stopwatch and there was a double entendre within the first two minutes. Um, and that, of course, yeah. carries on through the series, yeah. completely reflective of that 90s lad culture that was bubbling up yeah. with, with The Word as well and all those other shows. Uh, but this was right at the start of it, 1992. It was still starting to bubble up. Um, yeah. do, you know, do you think that you were right place, right time? Could Games Master have been the show that it was without feeding into that culture? Or was that an essential part of it? I think... Um... No, I, th- I think we. D- I think you're right. I think we, we predated that culture. Yeah. I kind of think that the the nineties ladders and thing was more ninety four and ninety six, culminating in Euro ninety six. So we got in just before that. I think we um we probably we became part of it in later series as I became more myself, and it was more laddish culture. I think initially it was it was like a carry on uh, movie. It was like kind of classic British black and white uh, movie humor double entendre jokes and and what's great about that is it i love that comedy tradition in in the uk anyway i was a big fan but what is also good is that it means that you can uh, get away with humor on what is scheduled uh, as a kid's show but you can also make it appeal to their mum and dad as well and again that's you don't get three million viewers just by being a kid's tv show you know so no. I was lucky that through the humour, we did manage to Trojan horse a lot of quite kind of adult lines in there, <laughs> which you certainly wouldn't do today, I don't think. No. Was there yeah. ever a point when you perhaps overstepped the mark for, for the audience, do you think? Oh, yes, constantly, <laughs> constantly. But the advantage of, of double entendre humour, and this was used as a defence by the producer once when there was a complaint, is you just say that... Um, no, that's not what we meant. You know, if if someone's complaining about you making a joke about, you know, waggling the stiffened shaft of your joystick, then you can just say, well, no, that's how you play a game. I'm sorry. Here's the Kempston joystick. That is a thick shaft. I am waggling it. That is how I play this game. If you happen to think it's about masturbation, then you're the weird one, not us. (laughs) And that was on. I'm not kidding you. We got, that was our defense all the time. And the only time we ever had a complaint upheld was because it was a visual joke. And this was in series, uh, I think it was series four or five, series four. And it was a Christmas special and I was cooking the Christmas dinner and I held up and it was, I had a, a big long carrot with two small Brussels sprouts. I've on seen it. Side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was pretty hand, obvious what that was. Cupped. And I, yeah. And I didn't even, <laughs> I think I just held up and didn't say anything. And someone complained about that. And that complaint was upheld. That was the only one. We had no defense. 
for like <laughs> it was an accident <laughs> We've got um, we've got a few of our viewer questions peppered in here. So mm. the first of which comes from Gavin Miller, and he asks, "How well behaved were the kids on the show? Were they a nightmare?" <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Do you know what they 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 were very well behaved. Um, again, I think that this was I, I there wasn't a lot of shows that had kids on to kind of to be guests on things. So it was kind of quite an exciting thing for them. It was more the opposite thing. The problem was, was getting them, you know, fired up a little bit and pulling right. them out. They're kind of being shy in terms of the, the, the actual audience. Again, it helps that they'd never seen anything like this. And this is the advantage of, you know, we only ever used a, a TV studio for the very last series, but these were gigantic sets. They were real world. So there was something, this wasn't like going to BBC studios and sitting in a conventional TV studio and everything. No, no, this was, this was going into this. It was entering an oil rig, you know, it was entering a prison. It was, you know, things like that. So that, that can be quite intimidating though, for a young kid, you know, an 11 year old going into this huge recreated oil rig, you know? Yeah. So how do you, you say you got to pep them up and g them up. How did you go about doing that? What were what were your methods? Well, a a lot of the a lot of the time, a lot of those kids were um, uh, they attended the Diamond Children's Theatre in uh, Newport Pagnell, which my mum ran a theatre school. So we got a lot of kids <laughs> from there. And so obviously they were much more confident for a start. And you right. can really tell, if you look back at some of those early series and you've got a kid who's like, oh, that kid's a little bit talkative. That's probably because my mum taught him drama. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, um, that was basically the, that, that was how we coped with that. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And of course, there were lots of celebrities along the way. They were a big part mm. of the show. You got to meet, um, well... No, you, they got to meet you, not you got to meet them. So they got to meet you, and, and it reads like a who's who of the 90s. We've got Mr. Motivator, Ulrika Johnson, E17, take that, Yuri Geller, Sam Fox, The Shaman. Um, were, were there any yeah. guests that really stood out for you? Well, I, I mean, this is what was great about me, about doing it, especially the first couple of cities, because I I was a fan of TV and I was a fan of yeah. them. So. You know, to to meet the likes of Ulrika Johnson and you know uh, Eric Bristow and Jimmy White and and athletes as well. Athletes was always my thing. My, my mum yeah. loved track and field. So you know, when, when you get the likes of a, a John Regis and a Roger Black and all those great great British athletes of the nineties, uh, it was just so exciting. And that there was a lot a lot of the a lot of the guests that we had initially was because they would say, well, "Who do you think we should approach?" And I would be like, "Well, who do I want to meet?" So it would be like, you know, Tony Slattery. I loved Whose Line Is It Anyway? Loved that show. Okay, let's let's go for all of them. So we got Tony Slattery. <laughs> we got Josie on. Um, we did uh, Mike McShane, the, the Canadian comic. We got him on accidentally. We were filming a feature in the middle of London and we bumped into him and he was a big fan of the show. So, yeah, it was, it was good. And footballers as well because I loved football. So, and as a result of that, I remember when we got Phil Babb, on, who played for Liverpool at the time, and we got on really well. He loved his video games, so then he invited me up to to Liverpool for a game. And before you know it, I'm hanging out with what were known as the Spice Boys of Liverpool at the time. So <laughs> Steve McManaman, Jamie Redknapp, uh, David James, Robbie Fowler, that whole gang of them. And I'm going out to nightclubs in Liverpool with them. And that's like good fellas. That's like you go in the back door, <laughs> they usher them, you got a table ready. So it was, there was a lot of that great kind of wish fulfillment for on my behalf when it came to celebrities uh, and it was yeah I'd like to meet that person let's get them on you know of course you were a celebrity as well when did you first realize that hey I'm a celebrity when, when did that dawn on you um, games master live yeah it did because that was you know I, I knew the show was big because of all the interviews that I had to do about it and all the work I was getting and so yeah when, when you would go and, and open up a virgin game center in norwich or whatever then yes there would be crowds and i'd be like wow but gays master live was a different level because it was birmingham nec you know it was a huge indoor convention center and it was absolutely rammed and there was people as far as the eye can see and i remember standing on the stage doing the live presentation of the show and that was good because that to me was kind of what I, you know, arrogantly always wanted as a stand-up was like one day it's going to be rooms of that size. Yeah. So I loved that part of it. That was almost like I'm telling a guy, all these people are laughing, yay, I've done it. <laughs> but then what I hated, Neil, 
what made me very uncomfortable was when I got off that stage and I walked through the place and and then you get you get mobbed and people are very nice and they're incredibly complimentary. But I think and actually we 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 had a we had a we launched the uh, Games Master Book on Kickstarter last year and and part of my process of writing th- this book, which was really was uh, the whole story of Games Master from lots of people that were involved, and I realised that. I was still obsessed with this idea that I wasn't cool because I hadn't got the word. So I was very self-conscious about how mm. I looked. And because I'm Scottish, uh, we be- everybody in Scotland has eczema anyway. And you take a red face when you get embarrassed or flustered. So I was always very se- – and so I didn't like that. And and I really did. And I never did like that kind of lots of people, you know, mm. kind of being uh, around me. And there's always that, there's that pressure as well where – I, I'm naturally a, quite a grumpy person. And so when you meet someone, you can't be grumpy because they like the show, they like you. It's not fair. So you have to be that version of you. And that's also very exhausting. Yeah. And so and there's, there's an element as well of them thinking they know you, I'm sure. They must, they must yeah. you know, being very familiar with you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind that so much. It's just, I think I just felt this this pressure that I had to be the best version of me. Right. Um, for any fan of the show, which is ridiculous because you don't. Nobody, people just want, do you know what? Because I'm the same. If I, people just want to go up to you and say, look, I really like your show. Thank you very much. And that's it. And they don't really want more than that. But you just get plus, oh my God, I've got to think of a funny guy for every person, <laughs> you know, in that same way that I always remember, you know, when, when, it, when I was a stand up comedian and you would get into a taxi and the taxi driver would say to you, Oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a stand-up comedian. Oh, tell us a joke then. What? <laughs> so I think that haunted me <laughs> as well. So I didn't handle I didn't handle that very well, and and uh, you know I I started kind of drinking and and doing assorted substances to try and bolster my self confidence, and that's that's very much a zero sum game. That yeah. is, but that got me. That's that's basically how I got through the rest of that decade, unfortunately. So the the standing on the stage having your space around you and looking out to that crowd. You thrived on that. You liked that. I liked that part, It was yeah. everything else that came with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've got a couple more uh, viewer questions here. Mr. Fujisawa um, is asking about the uh, guests who came on the show. Did you ever have a guest that you had to cut anything out of or completely cut out of due to them being rude or violent or anything like that? Did any guests just go too far? <laughs> being vi- definitely not being well the only person that was a bit violent hacksaw jim duggan the wrestler, oh, the wrestler. I, I, and the thing is when you get when you get people like that on what is great about them is that they are they are full on it's not like they sit there like dexy's midnight runners waiting to do come on island on top of the pops and they're sitting there wearing normal clothes and then they get changed into the farming outfits <laughs> no w, w, wf wrestlers come on a show and from the minute they walk in they are up to 11 from so you never know how far they're going to push it. you never know how crazy they are so when hacksaw jim duggan comes downstairs and he's battering bits of wood off himself you're like is he going to start battering bits of wood off of me? <laughs> um, so that that was always a little bit nerve wracking. But uh, no, I think that we were very lucky with the guests in that this was a completely unique thing for them to do as well. Mm-hmm. Nobody else had a video games TV show with celebrity guests coming on doing challenges. So it was really interesting for them. They weren't trotting out the same answers to the same questions about the same yeah. stuff. So they were they were a lot of fun. There was, uh, and I still don't know why this happened. There was there's only one time a celebrity appearance got cut out of the show, and that was the series that I didn't do, series three, and that was Paul Whitehouse from the Fast Show, and he was on the trailer for the whole series, and it never and they never got on the <laughs> actual show, and they cut that, and I think it was because uh, series three was was generally a bit of a was a complete mess behind the scenes for a lot of reasons that it wasn't terribly well organised. It wasn't just me that left; the original producer director all left, and a load of new people came in, and they just were just weren't kind of up to up up to the job unfortunately so that was the only celebrity that didn't appear was was paul whitehouse and that's the only cut i can think of probably uh, the height of his success as well when everyone really wanted to see paul I whitehouse know. You know? well that's that, i mean that's why they put him in the trailer yeah, yeah exactly. the, that's what's so bad it's a guest that's so big you put him in the season trailer and oh. he's not even on the show Bumped into him in an off license once, and I was too nervous to say hello or thank you or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just quietly shuffled past him. Do you um, know? Do, do you know that the last person I did that to, and it's haunted me all the time. Idris Elba, I saw in a bookshop in Toronto, and I literally was like, 
oh my god, that's not him. And I, and I did that thing where you kind of follow him around the place, and I'm like, it is Idris Elba. What do I say? Okay, but and I left the shop and I walked around and I phoned my wife. I'm like, Idris Elba's in this bookshop. And my wife's like, oh my God, oh my God, what are you going to say? And I'm like, I don't know. And I started thinking, and I, and I can't even remember what the line was. And I went back into the shop and he'd gone. Oh, so no. uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm with you. I've done that. I, I hate that. When you meet someone you love so much, you just can't think of anything interesting to say. But isn't that, isn't that interesting that I said, that's what flustered me about people coming up to me about Games Master, but yeah, it's actually the same on the other way around, Exactly isn't it? that, exactly <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Um, Andy Aldrich has a question. He says, E17 seemed a bit difficult to deal with when they came on. Were they difficult? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so again, if, if, if people aren't aware of the boy band Pop Wars in the UK in the 90s, so you had Take That. Take That were the ones that your mother wanted to marry their daughters. They were the lovely boys. They were squeaky clean and everything. And it was a clever idea. This this manager in the East End of London, Tom Watkins, decided, right, I'm going to come up with a bad boy version of Take That. <laughs> so he found these guys. And, they, you know, they were bad lads. I think a couple of them genuinely were tough guys. And, and he had the one, Tony Mortimer, who was, you know, was an incredible musician and everything, was a, was a great singer. And and Brian, who could sing, and then just a couple of lads who could, like, beat the crap out of you. So, and they they very much had to live up to that persona. They were they were genuinely nice guys. Okay. But they, they I guess, in much the same way that Hacksaw Jim Duckett <laughs> had to have a bit of wood that he battered off himself. East 17 had to, had to be basically be like they were gangsters all the time. So they were a bit sullen um but uh but yeah no they were they were i mean uh, yeah they were they were okay they were okay <laughs> they were okay they, were okay. they weren't okay. as much fun as take that and take that were were lovely and and when we came to write the uh the games master of the oral history book robbie williams did the foreword that's how nice take that uh take that hour <laughs> a, a keen a keen gardener i understand he is yeah that's right yeah that, that was the weirdest thing so we'd, we'd written this book and um, we said, right, we want a forward from someone and uh, we want someone who was a guest on the show who was huge in the 90s and is still big now. And uh, and Robbie was at the top of that list. And I bumped into him a couple of times in the 90s. We used to see each other at the same parties and things like that. But I'd never, obviously, you know, I'd kept, I don't know, like a whole group of celebrity friends I've kept in touch with. So, yeah, I just, I, I wrote an email to his uh, to his management at the record company and said, could you pass this on to Robbie? And I just said, listen, Robbie, I don't know if you remember me. I said, but I was huge in the nineties <laughs> and, uh, and we had a lot of fun. And we were on Games Master and we're doing this book. And if you could, you know, if you could write a forward, that'd be great. And then like a couple of days later, I wake up and there's an email in my inbox from a Rob W. And it was Robbie Williams. He'd he, with the foreword already written the most brilliant foreword where he says <laughs> the Games Master Golden Joystick that he won because he won the Super Bomberman oh, Challenge. Of course, yeah. He said that it's the only award that he displays publicly. All his MTV awards are in the cupboard. And I don't know if someone told me that that is true, that actually on his mantelpiece in Robbie Williams' house in Hollywood. There is the Games Master Golden Joystick. So, but it was a yeah, it was a lovely forward. And what was in, and he'd said to me in this email, he said, "Oh, well done for you know managing to get out the nineties alive." I said, <laughs> I, "I don't do any of that nonsense now. I'm just into gardening." And and as it happened, the reason I moved from the UK to Canada eventually in 2009 was uh, I bought a farm, so I was really into gardening as well. So I had like a, a week where I just exchanged gardening tips. I was giving Robbie Williams gardening Robbie tips Williams. Uh, <laughs> over the internet. And I hope it was basically involving manure and how important horse manure was for growing anything. <laughs> so uh, I like to think that Robbie Williams' neighbours in Hollywood are smelling. They go, what is that smell from? And it's because of me. I have actually made <laughs> Los Angeles smell of horse manure. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, you, you've touched on a couple of times, uh, um, you know, drink and substances and things like that. Uh, is this as a result of you handling fame as as, as someone too young to be handling this yeah. much fame? Is was that the trigger? What, what, tell us about young, it. Uh, just young and and just not very comfortable in their own skin and and finding it uh, finding talking to people a challenge, like constantly the same mm. thing. And so there was a lot of industry parties as well and it's just that horrible thing you have it you have a drink because it makes you feel a bit less nervous and then you have another drink and another drink and another drink and then you realize oh man i'm so i'm, I'm really drunk now but there's you know x 
other people that I have to meet at this thing and have to talk to. And then one day someone comes along and says, oh, well, here's this drug cocaine that can actually make you drink as much as you like and just take a hit of this and you can carry on drinking and it makes you feel supremely confident until three o'clock in the morning when you want to kill yourself. And, uh, and you will end up like for decades and decades of mental health problems as a result. They don't tell you that on the night and you don't think about that on the night. But that was, that's unfortunately the circle that you, that you kind of get into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you broke out of that circle before the end of the nineties or did it carry on a little bit longer than that? Uh, carried on, yeah, carried on a little bit longer. Um, yeah. but, uh, definitely firmly in the rear view mirror, not anything I've ever done in, in this country. Uh, but yeah, I was, I kind of, yeah, the nineties was, was the bulk of it. A couple of yeah. slips in the, uh, in the very early two thousands. Um, and, uh, yeah, including when I lived in the Lake district in the middle of nowhere. And it, that's a different challenge. Um, being a cocaine addict, <laughs> living half a mountain in the Lake District, very different kind of lifestyle than uh, than if you're one in London <laughs> in the nineties. Different but supply and demand problems. I am very, imagine. very different supply and a very different quality control as well. So that was and just and I'm much sadder. And I think that's what that's what made me kind of kick it in the end was it's all very well telling yourself, oh no, I'm just doing this so I can get through these, you know big showbiz parties and people don't think I'm boring and it's okay. But it's another thing when you're sitting there, <laughs> this goes back in the video games, I remember it, when you are sitting there playing championship manager, having been out in the pub in the, the nearest small town Lake District, and you're sitting playing championship manager in your little shed office doing lines of cocaine at like five o'clock in the morning on your own to play champion i mean what when is championship manager it's a spreadsheet if it, if it was like a super fast arcade game where you needed lightning yes. reflexes you would imagine okay i'll take some kind of upper but no click ninety thousand pound transfer <laughs> offer and that's when you realize okay it's the other way i'm not doing cocaine now the cocaine's doing me so yeah for sure <laughs> Coming back onto Games Master, the show then, you mentioned mm. Series 3, um, you disappeared, but it wasn't just you, it was the whole crew. I mean, yeah. was that, did you all just get together in a room one day and go, you know, was it a, a joint decision or um, was oh, it, no. No, no, you was just it, individually I, I, dropped off? I think that, um, well, what was what was interesting, and, and Jane Hewland, the boss, did this, did this right for 99% of the time. She always believed in... Um, she would rather give a job to a hungry young person who she could pay less to, but was going to had potential to do great things rather than pay some established person. So it wasn't just me as a presenter, the right. producer, the director, the researchers, this was all their first jobs. And so they did really well. And they were like, okay, I'm going to go on and do other things. But with me, it was a little bit more complicated in that there was a, there was a lot, there was a big financial angle and, and a financial angle on two things. One, I was getting offered a lot of work. I had an agent by this point and there was things I was being offered and Channel 4 would say, well, no, you can't, you can't do this thing with Sega because we've got this thing organized with Nintendo. And my agent was like, well, that's actually unfit. Give him more money or we can't give him more money. And then it culminated with the show being sponsored by McDonald's, which was not a company that I, I was a fan of and that mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, nobody consulted me, nobody asked me. And so I, in a fit of hissy fit peak, I said, right, <laughs> that's it. And, uh, and, and walked out. Fair enough. I mean, that's your brand you've got to protect. And if you don't want to associate yeah. that with, you know, junk food companies that you, you yeah. don't align with, then fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question now from a sensible one. He says, Games Master always seemed like quite a squashed down show, even to the point where the games reviews got fast forwarded in a VHS style. Did you ever yeah. test a longer format? Mm, that's a great question. That's a really good question. We didn't, but I can say that was, that was the toughest thing about the show, was getting it down to a TV half hour, 24 minutes, 15 seconds. And this is why, funny enough, when you look at the Take That Challenge, that they did on Super Bomberman. With the minute you've got five people, it's literally like the way it's edited. Oh, hi, Gary. Um, welcome to the show. Do you like to play a lot of video games? Yes. And then it cuts back. <laughs> no, he probably said about three sentences, but we had to cram it all in. So that was very tough. And yeah, the reviews were just a, a couple of sound bites. And, and, and also, 
And I, I would honestly, if people are watching this who, who like from abroad and that, who, who didn't watch the show, just watch any one of them and look at, well, maybe it's not that impressive now, but the sheer amount of technical special effects overlays that we had in the show, which back mm. then in the early 90s, it's not like you can do them on an app on your phone <laughs> like now. This had this was done on, on, on tapes and you had to put a graphic on one tape, bounce it down, to another tape, then play it in the two tapes together, bounce it, and it took a long time. And when you're dealing with 24 minutes and 15 seconds and you have an animation that takes eight seconds to come in and eight seconds to come out, that's also another challenge, but that all helped to kind of make the show so different. But when I came back uh, after Series 3 didn't really work out for anyone and they asked me back for Series 4, I... I was aware of that and I said, okay, here's the changes. We used to do a tip section called the consultation zone. And I said, let's do away with that. That's utterly pointless. We pick three games a week and we give a tip on one part of that game. Now, there's like thousands of games out there and people are going to tune in for the one in one million chance they're going to get. And so that was like three and a half, four minutes of real estate on the show. So I was like, get that out of the way. And instead, let's go to America and let's go and film funny stuff over there. So, uh, yes, that's a great question. It always was a very, very squashed show. And there are some ludicrously bad edits when you look back at it now because of that 24 minutes, 15 seconds, yeah. It makes sense to pull those tips out as well because um, uh, if you look at Bad Influence, they had the the data blast at the end, didn't they, with just all the tips, so just cram yeah. it all into that yeah and that that was a superb idea and they, they that was the best idea there they one of the best ideas with video games ever so yeah take tips for everything put it under the closing credits and run it really fast so you can fit them all in and then people have the choice to go back and yeah, watch exactly. it slow down it's a brilliant idea really good idea <laughs> Now, I hate to quote Wikipedia because this could be completely wrong, but there is an unreferenced mention that you wanted to make a late night version of Games Master for a more adult audience. Mm. Was that a thing? Yeah, I think when we um, when we spoke to each other about where we wanted to go with it and what we wanted to do, that that was one of the only things. Once you've once you've set a show in heaven, hell, Atlantis. This, this really me. Once you've done heaven and hell, that's kind of that, that's kind of it. There's there's a we didn't have a lot of ideas left. We a pirate ship was one thing. We we worked on a pirate ship, um, but then the only other thing was okay. Well, maybe if we wanted to keep evolving the show because we didn't want to rest on our laurels. That's how we always try to make it bigger and better every series. We said maybe we actually just need to go in the other direction and make it a late night show and make it actually more of a late night discussion kind of show okay. about video games. But that would have been a completely different show. And I kind of think in some ways I'm glad, if I, I am very glad that we didn't do that because if we'd done that under the Games Master banner, I think people would have gone, well, this isn't Games Master and it would sure. not have been a success. I'd, not that I don't think uh, that, that a news night style discussion arts type show about video games can't be done. It, it can and it would be incredibly popular. There's so many intelligent, articulate, passionate uh, people who can discuss video games and treat them at an intellectual level that they deserve. This, this is this is one of the things that annoy me. This is one of the reasons why I started this this podcast was I just felt there's so much to be said about video games in in terms that treat them as something as culturally significant and important as they are. It's not just a little bit of fun. These are things that when I was a kid, you know, saved our lives when we were we were children and and have you know plots and ideas and struggle with big issues as much as as any other art form does yeah. so it would maybe be interesting to do that but i think it would have it would have killed the show see i just assumed with all the the you know the joystick knob gags that came out of games master that when you talked about an adult show we would we were talking like baywatch nights you know games <laughs> master nights but you were talking well, more panel show <laughs> well do, do, but do you know do you know what's interesting about that though neil was we, we did one we did one late night version and it wasn't as much fun because again it's the minute that you are, are allowed to show everything there's no tension there right. and, and I, I noticed as well in later years when i went to work in uh, radio in canada there's one radio station i work for in nova scotia and technically after nine o'clock you were allowed to use the f word and for me it was a dream of years of struggling not to say it <laughs> and i never once 
used it because once you can, there's no fun. <laughs> and we realized when we did the adult version and we had clips of games, that are, you know, full nudity and swearing and everything, it was like, it's kind of a bit boring now, yeah. actually. You know, it's much more fun alluding to it. And it's much more exciting to get away with a Mortal Kombat fatality move at 6.30 in the evening on a sure. two time slot. The minute you do it on midnight, at midnight, it's like, well, where's the fun? Where's the fun in that? And, and that and, and Games Master was punk. I mean, it was dangerous. That's why kids liked it, because it was a really dangerous show for them. And the minute you take it out of that slot where it's dangerous, I think it ceases to be as dangerous, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, you, you mentioned punk. No chat about Games Master can happen without the Dave Perry question. I mean, mm. would you class Dave Perry as punk? It's interesting. Uh, yeah, he was. He was certainly was a became a punk outlier on on the show as it evolved over the years. And I think that we were a show that took ourselves and importantly the video games industry less and less seriously. And I thought that was really important. The bigger the games industry got, the more I felt we had to prick its pomposity um, by taking the piss. And Dave, Dave took himself really seriously and and now with the benefit of maturity i see that all he was doing was protecting his brand and his sure. brand was was kind of you know uh, the games animal it was about no no take games seriously i'm a serious games player and we were just farting around by that point and so that was that was the problem and it, it was always going to result in and come to an almighty kind of head yeah and that for our international viewers uh dave the games animal perry was the superstar gamer of the show the the man to beat and then he lost this mario 64 head-to-head -head challenge and he, he took it rather badly um yeah. i mean w w would i sh should i say too much to your amusement i mean you seemed you see you were you were kind of smirking about it at the time or <laughs> were was you nervous a... what was what was going on there well it was it was weird because the what happened was it was a Christmas show and we wanted to do something a bit different and we had our four co-commentators and and we thought, well, well, we'll make them go head to head and we'll have a quiz rounds and then uh, on games and then we'll have like a, the, the two people who get the highest will compete in a challenge at the end. But Dave, because he had a book coming out about video games and he didn't want to be made to look foolish, he, he behind my back, asked for the questions for the quiz. Right. And that just made me abs. I went incandescent decent rage I was filled with when I found out because the producer Johnny felt, felt guilty and then he told me look he said okay Dave asked for the question I've given him and I said right that's it I said you've ripped them up and you're going to write some new ones I had a, a, a big altercation with Dave offset and then I was like all right do you know what I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna mess with you on this show then so we just took the and I asked them ridiculous questions that couldn't be answered and <laughs> you know and and yeah, so that was all that, genuine. That was all authentic sort of tension there. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. But, well, by that stage, Dave and I just weren't talking at yeah. all. You know, we'd do our bits on set and then that was it. We'd talk outside of it. So, uh, so yeah. And it's quite quite amazing the way that worked out because it was a video game that he still should have been good at. And he tried to – if people remember, they um, – Oh, Mario 64, it's, a, it's a, a slip slide away, it's called, and it's a snow level. And it was basically whoever could get to the bottom of it in the quickest time. Kirk, who played it, uh, who was a uh, finalist, my one of my best mates, who's a complete stoner idiot, uh, just basically <laughs> fell off at like the second turn. So all Dave had to do was last longer. And, and this is why he really was, that the hubris is quite astonishing, that instead of just backing his ability, he probably could have just played it normally and he would have kicked Kirk's arse. But he was so worried, he pulled back on the joystick to slow the descent on the slope. But unfortunately, that game, if you do it too much, Mario flips over on his stomach and falls straight off. So it was just, <laughs> a, it was quite a, a delicious moment and that's why it you know it's by far the most memorable moment of the show it still appears on compilation shows of you know tv's most embarrassing moments in the uk to to this day and and this is why when i find i know that dave has different versions of what happened and, and it was like no no it was all fixed and it was all set up you couldn't set up something to work that brilliantly you just couldn't it wouldn't have <laughs> no that was how it was you know 
Yeah, M- Mr. Frozen Pancake asks, do you ever get sick of being asked the Dave Ferry question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Be I honest. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do, but and I kind of do because I, it's really hard. I, I, a lot of me, I feel, I said some really bad things about Dave mm. over, over the years. And I feel, you know, I feel really guilty now. And because it's, it's, listen, it's, it's not that different from bullying. You know, and I've I've had kids that have gone through that, and you realise that if you take the out of someone in print or in the, it is it's all it's all a form of bullying, really. If they're weaker than you and can't defend themselves, which you know Dave can't um, as eloquently or with this bigger mouthpiece as, as I have, so I feel really bad about that. So it's so every time that I'm asked that question, I kind of feel okay. I should say, oh no, it's okay. But at the same time, that is what happened. But yeah. also, I'm worried that then. I just a whole round of people will now just take the t- Dave and this will carry on. It's like, I get it. He was young as well. I was a soul. I was probably a way too aggressive. He had this brand. He took himself way too seriously. I'm sure we all wish that we could have been better versions of ourselves. So I would kind of like to let him off the hook now. But at the same time, <laughs> this story is the story. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, and it is, a, it is a good one. In the name of karma... Do you have any embarrassing stories about yourself that happened on the show? <laughs> oh, yeah. do you know what? Yes, I do. Oh my goodness! Right. So, I uh, I love I love singing. My dad was a was a kind of big pub singer in our broth, and I've had bands and everything like that. But I have um, I'm a very nervous singer. Right. And I was haunted by when I was a kid. I was tone deaf. And I remember I was asked, I went to the auditions for the choir when I was about six years old. And I remember standing up in front of the whole class for the tryout and I sang and the class all laughed. And the teacher was like, oh, you know, very funny, Dominic, go and sit down. Because it was so bad, she thought I was taking the... And that's one of these childhood humiliations that kind of stay with you. And then so fast forward years later, and it, I, think it, I think it was that same Christmas special, Series 4, where I held up the, um, the carrot and the two... Brussels sprouts was that we had a oh no 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 it was not it was it was it was later too but anyway we had a we had a band on and I was supposed to sing chestnuts roasting on an open fire one of my favourite Christmas carols and just before we literally was like action I remembered this moment from oh, school no. about getting Flashback. up front and singing and Neil I couldn't find the note. <laughs> Every time I tried to sing, I was so out of key. And and it was just, I had a whole crew waiting and everything. And in the end, uh, we have it. We just did do it instrumentally in the end. And the weirdest thing is that I, <laughs> that happened when I was doing radio in Toronto. It was a very similar situation. It was a big Christmas party, live on air, Q107 Toronto, the biggest one, the biggest radio stations in Canada. And it's the live Christmas show. And I've got a full band behind me and I'm singing this. And again, I have this thing I remember just before it. And again, I'm completely off key. So this is a horrible recurring thing that I have. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, yeah, singing, man. Singing, there we go. Dave, if, if, you ever, if you ever go down to Dave Perry's tattoo shop, he needs to put that on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to make me sing in front of everyone at his tattoo shop. Let's just come to the end of Games Master then. I mean, why did Games Master have to end? It was, was it 97? I think it was. Yeah. Then, well, it was, in, it was interesting because it was actually 96, uh, okay. uh, Series 6, and we, we decided that that was it. Uh, we'd all... Again, it was that same thing where everybody wanted to go on and do different things. You know, we were, we'd all started young. We were getting to that stage. And especially as a television presenter, you feel you need to develop and do different things. I had a lot of offers. I'd been doing a lot of sports radio for BBC Five Live. And they are, Channel Five were launching as a TV channel. And they asked me to do a lot of sports stuff for them. So I was like, OK, I'll, I'll now I'll go and become the sports guy. And, and that was it. And it was like, OK, that's... Thank you, Games Master. That was lovely, but I'll move on. And then it was just two weird things happened. Weirdly, Channel 4, and, and people people think I'm joking when I say this to this day. How can a TV company do that? They forgot to take us out of the schedules. They genuinely did. <laughs> and it came to, there was a phone call at the office. There was literally only one person left there because the whole production had shut down ages ago. And they said, where's, where's your pre-publicity photographs for Games Master Series 7? And someone was like, we're not making Series 7. Well, we've got you in the Channel 4 schedules. It's starting in five weeks' time. And 
I guess they were lucky that I had, in that very short space of time, um, got really sick of the sports shows I was doing on Channel 5 very quickly. Games Master spoiled me. It spoiled my entire career because this was a show where I was allowed to do whatever I wanted. And it was popular enough that I had complete control over every single thing and I didn't have to do anything that I didn't want to. And then all of a sudden you do another show and you've got bosses and commissioning editors and channel heads who are saying, oh, you can't say that. And I'm like, oh, yes, I can. And I will because it's a live show. So I say it and then I get into a lot of trouble. And it's yeah. just like, oh, this is really boring. This isn't fun. And luckily, that was the time when I got this phone call saying, you're not going to believe this. They, they forgot to cancel Games Master. We have to get a show together in five weeks. Now, I know that you're down in Southampton doing all this stuff for Channel 5. And I'm like, I'll be on the next train. And I literally <laughs> quit quit the Channel 5 shows uh, and went up. And somehow we managed to get an entire series of Games Master off the ground in about five weeks and then what we did then was we were like okay let's make it completely clear now so we were the first show ever to do this I, I, we had a countdown to the show ending we made a fit we had a feature of it at the end of every single show i said only nine shows to go only eight shows to go and we're taking it off the air we're not coming back i promise and it came to the very last episode and we actually deconstructed the whole set over the course of the show we took it apart we took up our costumes and everything like that so it really was there was nothing left they could channel four couldn't we couldn't have been more plain with the message right <laughs> that's it <laughs> that's it you had a jcb come across the set you even had yes um, right you yeah. know a, a games master broke character and stepped he into did. a taxi at the end so there was that no was going the, back from that that and that is incredible that was the very the very last shot was patrick moore as himself going into a taxi and that's amazing that's probably it's the most proudest kind of bit of of tv radio of anything that i've ever done that last show i was so proud yeah. of that yeah, well, it was, so you should be, you know, it was a huge part of, um, you know, my life growing up in the 90s and, and a lot of the listeners will be really appreciative for the work that you did. And um, of course, there's a lot more to you than Games Master. So just just fill us in because I'm aware that I've had you for a long time here, Dominic, and I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, just fill us in from Games Master up to the present day. Give us a whistle stop tour. I know it, it's a couple of decades. There's a lot to fill in, but uh, um, yeah, where did you I go? Bas I basically... Uh, uh, yeah, after Games Master, then I, I had a bit of a breakdown. Thought the Millennium Bug was going to happen for real. So uh, left London, quit all my jobs down there, moved to the Lake District, went completely mad. Millennium Bug didn't happen. Uh, so I had to start my career again, did it in Scotland. Uh, luckily, I, I fell into some radio stuff there, won some awards for doing music radio next from Scotland. And then uh, another boss came in who I didn't like, quit that job. Um went to Canada. <laughs> I thought by that stage, so this, this was great. This was the XFM Scotland. We, you know, we, we won awards. I was the only person nominated for a Sony award that didn't work in England, didn't work for the BBC. We helped launch the careers of, you know, Biffy Clyro and The View and Glass Vegas and all these fantastic bands and the Fratellis. And all it takes is one suit to come in as a boss and just screw the whole thing up by not getting it and trying to make it commercial yeah. so i got really sick of all that stuff by this point so i was like right i'm retiring at the grand old age of 38 and <laughs> i'm going to move to canada so i went and bought a farm in nova scotia and ran out of money in a year it's a great year brilliant year love best year of my life i kind of just swam in rivers with my kids and went hiking and then so i had to start again at the bottom in radio in canada as a complete unknown at 40, 41, 42, <laughs> I started off very much as Alan Partridge, except I was in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, not Norwich. And I worked my way up, clawed my way up to the top, went to Toronto, uh, went to Calgary, and then uh, did kind of, you know, did really well, some big morning shows. And then another suit came in, took over, fell out with him, got fired. Um, and then so that, that was a bit... that, that that work ethic that you mentioned when you were a younger man that hadn't left you then you were still no. you know climbing no. up the pole there yeah yeah and and this and this is how I managed to do it in Canada as an unknown as a deeply unfashionable unknown at an unfashionable age with a foreign accent is there's no secret I worked ten times harder than anyone else and that's not difficult in radio because you'll be able to tell with commercial radio wherever you are. The average radio announcer on commercial radio is a lazy bastard. They do nothing. They open up the microphone. They tell you the weather. Listen, if I want the weather, I'll open the window and look outside. Give me jokes. Tell me something I, I don't know about the song. And that's all that. That's all that I've done. And and so yeah, that that's no secret. That's that's how you do it. 
and uh, but yeah but then so about three years ago now I had a clash and, and I was yeah fired by another idiot in a suit but they had to pay me a lot of money this time because my ratings were so good so that allowed me to my wife decided that she was going to go out and work and I was going to be a stay-at-home dad and and write stuff and that's when I wrote the games master book and I, I started writing projects but I was a terrible stay-at-home dad um all my kids are now basically 18 or above except for one of them but they don't listen to anything I say, so I'm I'm going back into radio now. <laughs> like, <I'm, laughs> in about yeah, in about nine days' time, I'm 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 flying to the other side of Canada um, to to get back in radio after a, a good couple, a good two three years off. Oh, a new job, congratulations! Yeah, thank and you. Uh, imagine if all of that experience, all of those decades of broadcasting experience, were put into a video games podcast. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what you did. <laughs> Will that continue with the new job? Yeah, no, it will. It's what what's great is that uh, this I, I I can't say not that anyone's going to know anything about not not that anyone from Canadian radio is necessarily going to be watching this, but I can't say what the job is, but it's one that allows me a significant time to still carry okay. on with the video game stuff and the writing, which is good because I I'm a column in the Guardian, I got a column in the Sega Powered, that's one of these great retro magazines that's kind of rebooted in print form. So I'm, I'm carrying on all that stuff because what is so weird is that I realized only recently that I think I love video games now for the same reasons that I loved them as a kid. And funny enough, just right, my next Guardian column is going to be about this, about the the how important the addictive nature of video games is when you have to escape from the world. And I'm at this stage where I wanted to escape from the world when I was a kid because it was horrible and violent and nasty and grey. And the last couple of years I've had on this planet, the world's horrible and terrifying and scary. And, you know, we have to make big decisions and, and, and we're run by idiots. And I had a stage a couple of weeks ago where I just, I had to escape. And I'm not doing that through alcohol and drugs now. And it's so ironic that, I, so I deliberately set out to find video games that were so addictive that they could, I could escape after years of saying to my kids, yeah. stop playing that video game and do your work. And I think that's really valid for adults. We need that kind of of downtime and escapism. I think so, so yes, yeah. I love so, games again, and because I, I think I'm using them, I, I'm I'm using them instead of drink drugs stuff like that. I'm using it as a way of escaping. Yeah, so not not all addictions are bad then. <laughs> no, I, I, no, they're not. I mean, I'm addicted to work. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know, it's, it's interesting all... because it, it's kind of been taught now that it's it's a dirty word to use in the context of video games. Addiction, it should be enthralling yeah. or something like that. But addiction is bad, and the magazines used to have an addiction rating on a game when they were reviewed, and that's yeah. all kind of disappeared now. So, um, but but you're you're singing the praises of addiction for video games again. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's all just. It's all semantics, isn't it? It's it's you yeah. know, you say something's compulsive instead of yeah. addictive. It's the same <laughs> it's the same thing, really. But I think it, yeah, it's all about I it's, I think it's difficult, Neil, because I, I am an addict, right? And one way I am an addict, I'll always be an addict. And it doesn't matter what what it is, whether it's, you know, alcohol or drugs or video games or uh running. Oh my god, like see run like running, hiking. Hiking, I get addicted to. I'm lucky that where I've lived on the edge of the Rocky Mountains for the last three years. Uh, but if I don't get out in the mountains every week, mental health wise, I just, oh. So yeah. I think it is, it's all about replacing unhelpful. Let's not say unhealthy, because again, that's a difficult. It's about replacing unhelpful addictions with helpful addictions if you're an addict. And I yeah. think most of us are. I think most people are addicts, because I think that's how society improves and gets on people have to be addicted to bettering something so i think it's not it's not necessarily a bad word it's only if you had the word cocaine <laughs> then it's a very <laughs> bad word and uh dominic's uh what's it called dominic's purple podcast no there, there are more words in the podcast tell us about the podcast <laughs> okay the so name, I, in the in the 90s uh, i had a column in games master magazine called dominic's big purple column which was obviously a, another penis joke and so uh, the idea was that uh, i would that this is called dominic's little old purple column there because you know i I'm, I'm i'm a bit older now and everything's everything's smaller so so yeah but it's the same thing it's just like a, it's a free for all and and of what i'm thinking uh, about games that week and that's what's good and it's really refreshing because i don't 
have an editor tell me what and what not to do and say. So there's a lot of retro stuff. I, I, I've, I've fallen into this thing when I started writing about uh, retro arcade games of writing poems about them. So, uh, so yeah, so I did Space of Eras. I just did Pac-Man for the latest one because I felt... Um, I tried to write, but I started thinking about the the elusiveness of escape for Pac-Man. That he's he's kind of chained to this thing that you know he just eats these dots, and at the end of it, oh, it's another maze. It's the same sh- different day. But um, but what's what's even worse for Pac-Man is that there's that little exit at each side. So I just thought it gives him the illusion of escape, and he goes out one side and. Uh, just to reappear on the other. So I just I wrote a poem about just how how su- the, how suicidal Pac-Man must have felt in that. So I like being able to do things like that. Yeah. The other poem was about the the rigid tactical structure of Space Invaders and how that must have been really depressing as a young conscript into that Space Invader army who, like everyone else, has been sold this 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 illusion of the glory of war, and then he's just there going. Eh. <laughs> knowing, knowing that all it needed was for a couple of them to break off like Galaxians, and they'd have won. Yeah. But no, they have to stay there. So I like, I like thinking about weird things like that about video games, and I think there's still a market for it. I think we're blessed in that we have got incredible retro gaming uh, YouTube shows and podcasts. People are so passionate. The passion is unbelievable, and I think that the only thing I can offer that world that's that's in any way different is my own weird humorous take on those things so that's basically what it is i'm trying to so looking back at retro stuff and trying to look at them in a very weird way but also trying to find a bridge between those of us who loved games in the 90s but then had to go on and got distracted by proper jobs and kids and now modern gaming is just it's terrifying and I'm trying to find a bridge. I'm trying to find games that's like, no, 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 it's okay. We can play this. And it's not like playing Call of Duty online and getting people dabbing on you and the horrible talks. You know, Here's a nice little game we can play and we can lose ourselves again. And it can get us through the in life like they did in the 80s and 90s when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find this show if they want to go and listen to it? Do you know the, the easiest way? You can Google Dominic Diamond and Substack. It's on a great a platform called Substack that a lot of great writers are using now because they can go directly to, to fans and you can directly support the work. There's free versions and paid versions. There's tons of free stuff on there. Uh, or dominicdiamond.net is my website or at Dominic Diamond on Twitter. That's that's probably the easiest. There we go. I'll put I'll put links in the show notes as well for everyone to click on. Dominic, thank, thank you, you for taking the time today, sir, to, to share your memories with us and um for being that guy in the nineties who helped to make gaming a little bit cooler for us nerds. We do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good luck with your with your podcast and your future ventures. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. It was a pleasure to do it there and it's a pleasure to talk about it today. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official Cave Dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro. And if you have already done that, stick around because we're about to put your questions to Dominic. Dominic.